Todos les doy la bienvenida a la Casa de América. Soy el director de la Casa de América, Santiago Miralles. Eh, querría eh, avisarles de que hay unos pequeños cambios en el programa, tal como estaba previsto. Eh, va a tomar la palabra después de mí el señor Jorge Sainz, secretario general de Universidades. Eh, le seguirá el vicepresidente de la Fundación Santillana, Emiliano Martínez. Eh, después dará su conferencia el doctor Andreas Schleicher, director de Educación y Competencias de la OCDE. Y por último, clausurará el acto el secretario de Estado para la Cooperación Internacional y para Iberoamérica, don Fernando García Casas. Eh, sin más, querría agradecer sinceramente a la Fundación Santillana, a Mariano Jabonero, que fue quien incitó que hiciéramos este acto, el que eligiese en la Casa de América para presentar el nuevo informe PISA en lo que respecta a Iberoamérica, por supuesto a la OCDE, por estar aquí otra vez con nosotros. Como saben, con la OCDE trabajamos asiduamente. Tuvimos aquí el día 24 de noviembre a Gabriela Ramos, que habló del informe PISA 2012. Como va todo muy rápido, ahora tenemos ya el informe PISA 2015, del cual hablará seguidamente el señor Schleicher. Tiene la palabra el señor Sainz, secretario general, cuando quieras. Bueno, en primer lugar, buenas tardes. Eh... Gracias a la Fundación Santillana por invitar al Ministerio de Educación a este acto eh, y muchas gracias al bueno, profesor Slicer, a la Fundación Santillana, a todos los miembros de la Fundación Santillana y a la Casa de América. Es cierto, como decía antes el, el director de la Casa de América, que estuvimos aquí hace unos días hablando de la educación en América según el informe PISA 2012. Y yo creo que el principal resumen que pudimos sacar de ese, de ese acto fue el hecho de la importancia de PISA, que nos sirve para, para analizar y ver cómo va la evolución de las políticas educativas en los países. Es decir, ver cómo se van desarrollando los países, ver qué medidas se están tomando que son, que son de éxito. Y más allá de rankings y de situaciones que son muy dadas a aparecer en prensa, lo importante es los instrumentos que dotan las uh, instituciones educativas para poner en marcha de cara al futuro. En el caso de España, por ejemplo, los datos que se vieron fue que España está ahora mismo en el mismo ámbito que los principales países europeos, pero que tenemos que seguir mejora, haciendo mejoras y seguir mejorando la educación. Y en este sentido, yo creo que el Pacto de Estado por la Educación que se está planteando ahora mismo en el Congreso, estoy seguro que va a mirar todos los datos que han salido de PISA, los va a analizar va a ser una de las principales fuentes de referencia hacia, hacia dónde tiene que ir eh, nuestra educación. Es muy importante también analizar estos datos para Iberoamérica, poner el contexto iberoamericano, ver también qué medidas en países iberoamericanos han tenido éxito. La inversión que se está haciendo en Iberoamérica hacia la educación es una inversión muy importante. Los países están muy comprometidos con todo el ámbito educativo. Y hay que ver qué medidas están siendo más eh, exitosas de cara a sobre todo al futuro de, de Iberoamérica, que son sus jóvenes, la gran cantidad de jóvenes que están en Iberoamérica y que nos van a permitir que el futuro iberoamericano y también, por supuesto, el español, sea para el futuro mucho mejor. Muchas gracias. La verdad es que, aunque la organización de esta conferencia ha sido un poco precipitada en el tiempo, la oportunidad de contar como un, con un conferenciante como Andreas Schleicher en Madrid, era un verdadero anticipo de regalo navideño para todas las personas interesadas en conocer cómo está el, la educación en el mundo y en nuestro mundo más próximo. Para no eh, restar tiempo a lo que es el objeto de la convocatoria, que es la conferencia del director de educación de la OCDE, eh, yo voy a abreviar haciéndoles dos comentarios. Uno de ellos eh, está al hilo de una colaboración de la que hemos sido afortunados para poder difundir los estudios PISA y en torno a los estudios PISA toda una serie de trabajos eh, e investigaciones de, del Departamento de Educación de la OCDE. Y de ahí la una reflexión que les, a, la, a la que les invito es que, obviamente, 
Esto lo venimos haciendo desde el primer PISA en el año 2000. Y obviamente entonces PISA no tenía ni el alcance ni el impacto que tiene en la actualidad. ¿Qué ha permitido este desarrollo raro y verdaderamente asombroso? Bien, cabe que ustedes hagan hipótesis más allá, obviamente, de la capacidad de Schleicher y de su equipo para llevarlo adelante y de tener un plan eh, bastante consistente. Tal vez, tal vez, eh, detrás de ese eh, extraordinario desarrollo, algo tenga que ver la receptividad de la sociedad contemporánea respecto a los desafíos que tiene planteados la educación en el mundo. Y en cualquier caso, creo que todo este recorrido ha servido para demostrar algo que en aquellos momentos no, estaba, no era tan evidente. Y es que los estudios y los análisis serios, las evaluaciones y los indicadores rigurosos contribuyen y contribuyen de una manera, me atrevo a considerar destacada, a la eh, al respaldo y a la atención que las sociedades presten a la educación, a que valoren la importancia de lo que les eh, eh, significa. Y por otra parte, respecto a los sistemas educativos, a los tomadores de decisiones, a los directivos y a los docentes, a señalar líneas de mejora y experiencias interesantes de éxito. El otro comentario eh, tenía que ver, eh, de alguna manera, como presentación, eh, algo que estaba en el contenido de la conferencia que va a impartir eh, el doctor Schleicher. Y se refiere al ámbito iberoamericano. Eh, es curioso, eh, y es que desde el año 2000, los países de allá, los países latinoamericanos, estaban muy poco representados, tenían una presencia muy escasa en los estudios PISA. Tal vez en el inicio, porque eh, eh, el ámbito de la OCDE eh, en él eh, eran muy pocos los que estaban. Pero, curiosamente, eh, con una vocación personal y directa eh, y con viajes eh, del doctor Schleicher eh, y que nos unió en la vocación que nuestra fundación tiene allí por la educación, empezó, empezaron a entrar. Eh, y hoy eh, son mayoría, como tendrán ocasión de seguir en la conferencia. Y además, el incorporarse al estudio, a, a, a los análisis de PISA, se ha convertido en amplios sectores de la región en un indicador de transparencia de la gestión educativa y en un indicador de voluntad de reformas y de mejoras. El otro indicador que no está en el título es el de las competencias, el de las competencias educativas. No ha sido el de las competencias una aportación de PISA, está en el moderno pensamiento y práctica educativas. Está, por ejemplo, en alguna de las leyes de educación españolas, pero evidentemente está, y de una manera nuclear, en las pruebas PISA. Las competencias educativas son hoy un eslabón para mejorar la educación en el mundo, porque subrayan la necesidad de complementar los conocimientos y los saberes que tienen una larga tradición en la educación con el saber hacer, que es un requisito imprescindible para capacitar a la ciudadanía. Y nada más, tiene la palabra el doctor Schleicher. I want to start by thanking director Santiago Mirales for hosting us. This is the first address for discussion and dialogue among Ibero-American countries, so it's a privilege to share our findings with you here. I also want to thank uh, Jorge Sainz for being with us tonight. He's been a very generous host for us and supporter for our work on the, in the OECD. And I want to thank my friends from Santiana, Emiliano, 
Martinez, of course, and also Mariano Javiero, and I've seen Jaime Mascaro. The three of them were talking about PISA long before anyone in the government was talking about it. So it's been a privilege to work with them over so many years to work on this. Just a couple of words on the PISA assessment. On the chart here, you see the countries that took part in the assessment in gray, the OECD countries, and blue countries beyond the OECD membership. And the focus of our last assessment was on science. But not just whether students can reproduce what they learned in science. Had we focused on this, most of the countries in the Ibero-American continent would have done better on PISA. But we focused on something else. We wanted to see to what extent students can think like a scientist. To what extent they can extrapolate from what they know, use their knowledge in science creatively. Because that is what's so important today. Science knowledge changes day by day, year after year. But the capacity to think like a scientist becomes more important every day. I want to talk a little bit about more detail about what I mean by this, the competency in science. It's about our capacity to explain the world around us in scientific terms. It's about our capacity to evaluate, design scientific inquiry. It's about analyzing, interpreting evidence. Those things are so fundamentally, and they have to do, of course, with knowledge. Knowledge of the science, you know, what do we know in biology, chemistry, physics, very important. I'm a physics graduate by nature, I think this is very important. But also knowledge about science, the epistemic knowledge. No? What are the foundations of science as a way of looking at the world? No? Very important part of our PISA assessment. And of course, this doesn't work in isolation. You can do very well on a test, you can know a lot about science, but how do you relate to this? To what extent is that your own future? Attitudes, a um, very important part of our assessment. So that's what I'm going to talk about. But before I talk about Ibero-American countries, I want to just show you one slide. We started our last assessment in 2006 in science. No? The year 2006 is hard to remember for us. No? It was the year before the iPhone was invented. No? Very far in the past. No? We didn't have much of the technology that surrounds us. No? We didn't have video streaming, none of these things. But you can see, actually, science outcome among the OECD countries didn't change very much. And the world continued to change. 3D printing, we take it for granted today. Robotics, virtual reality, all of those things have happened. But again, you know, the world of school education stayed where it was. And even these days, you know, think about big data, think about, you know, virtual reality, think about all of the things that happen around us, cloud computing, biogenetics, huge changes in the environment. And the world of schooling has remained the same. Across most countries, the world has changed and our learning outcomes have more or less stayed where they were. But there are exceptions. I want to talk about one exception, this is Portugal. No? Portugal started out from way below the OECD average, but continued to improve, continued to improve. And now it's the first Ibero-American country which has crossed that line and basically doing better than the average. But the world doesn't stand still, and that's very important as well. You can look to Singapore here. No? They started from a high level and they don't wait for everyone to catch up. They continue to improve. They continue to advance. Changing world, even though not in many countries. So the first thing everybody does is, you know, how do countries come out on a PISA test in the field of science? And you can line up countries, the countries with very strong performance, come out on top. Singapore number one, many countries in Asia. But also in Europe, Estonia, Finland. 
North America, Canada, comes out very strong. But what you see here is about the equivalent of five years of schooling. No. Huge gap in the knowledge and skills of 15-year-old students around the world. No. And then you can see where Ibero-American countries are. Again, you know, Portugal was the first country crossing the line towards strong performance. Spain with good results. And then you can see countries following in the Latin American world with quite a large performance variability there as well. No? Not all of this is about wealth. It's actually interesting. When you look at, you know, to what extent do we predict those results by the level of economic development, it's part of the explanation. But the world is no longer divided between rich and well-educated nations and poor and badly educated ones. That was true in the 1960s. It's no longer true. Today we do have some education systems despite coming out of poor environments with strong results. I just want to highlight one example. When you look at the country of Vietnam, coming out here, a relatively poor nation that has made education a priority and within a very short period of history made sure that most of that students are actually coming out with strong results. I want to introduce a second dimension and that is equity. How successful are our nations to moderate the impact of social background? To ensure that all students do well, students from all backgrounds. Nobody wants to be here where performance is poor and there are large social disparities where you are born, your postal code determines how you come out in school and in life. Some people believe if you want to achieve well, you have to just accept that there are large disparities and some people focus on equity and accept, you know, then we just have only mediocre results. But time and again, PISA shows us that we can combine high quality and equity. If you look at the right upper corner, no. this is not empty. There are actually many countries around the world that show us that we can do well for children from all social backgrounds. It's one of the most important findings that poverty is not destiny, that students from all social backgrounds can achieve and actually do achieve. And I want to talk about some of those countries in more detail, but before I do that, some people who see that chart, they say, this is all about culture. This is not about education. This is about societies. Probably that is part of the truth. But if it would be all of the truth, we wouldn't see any changes. We would see the picture year after year, decade after decade. And that's not true. We've actually seen some really important changes. And I want to show you just some. If you see, for example, where Colombia was and where it is now, huge improvement. Colombia didn't move a few points. It moved by almost a full school year. It's a little bit to the left. That means the wealthy student benefited more than the poorer students. That's not so good, but overall improvement was significant. Or you can look at Norway, no? raising performance. You look at Romania and Portugal, I mentioned already. No? Very, very impressive kind of improvements. So the world keeps changing, not in many, many parts, but in some, in very kind of significant ways. There's another way in which you can improve, and that is Closing the achievement gap. No? The most fundamental challenge to most Ibero-American countries is the large social disparities. But we have seen progress. I want to show you just a few examples. Here you can see the case of Bulgaria. No? Closing the gap, moving to the center. Here you can see the same thing for Mexico. No? Very successful in moving from the red part into the yellow part of the chart. And you can see Slovenia, another example. The United States. You know, the United States was one of the countries with the largest social disparities for which we had data. Now, 10 years later, still not a good education system, but one that gives young people a fairer chance to succeed. And you can see here, Brazil, 
also, you know, maybe they could have raised performance more. But the one thing that Brazil did, getting more young people to participate in school and giving the disadvantaged children a better chance to succeed in education. And there are more countries, you know. I mean, what I'm telling here is that we have seen progress in the world. Progress in giving more people a better education in many places around the world. The one thing I also want to highlight is not just about raising the quality, it's also simply getting people into places. No? If you think about Brazil, in 2003 in Pisa, we had only half of the Brazilians, sorry, sorry, half of the Brazilians in school. Today, it's more than two-thirds. No? And still, Brazil has been able to raise quality because many people say if you get more children into school, well, you know, quality will be compromised. Actually, you can see, you can actually give more people access and still raise the quality of learning outcomes. And that's true in other countries of Latin America as well. I think very, very important, very impressive. I want to show you my favorite chart from PISA. What I'm going to do is I show you the student performance by decile of social background. What you see here is, in the red square, these are the 10% of the most disadvantaged children in the Dominican Republic. No? Children from poor families who have no education, live in very poor conditions and so on. And they do very badly on the PISA scale. These are the 10% wealthiest children in the Dominican Republic. No? And they do better. Many people say, well, you know, that's what you would expect. You come from a wealthy family, they're going to invest more in you, you come up better. But what we can now do is ask ourselves, let's think about who those children are and how those children would perform if they were to go to school in other countries. So we can actually look at that. And when you do that, you can see how much variability there is in the performance of children who grow up in, in similar conditions. Amazing differences. And this tells us the problem is not the children, the problem is our schooling system. You can see the 10% of the most disadvantaged children in Vietnam. Those 10% do better than the 10% wealthiest in parts of Latin America, and still better even in the wealthier work of Ibero-American countries. Poverty is not destiny. We can learn from a country like Vietnam that, you know, we can attract the most talented teachers into the most challenging classrooms and give every child a chance to success. Huge variability in the performance of similar children. Because the first criticism people always have about PISA is you compare apples with oranges, wealthy children with poor children. No, no. This chart compares children who grew up in identical circumstances or similar circumstances. And you can see, depending where you go to school, you come up with very, very different performance variability. There's another way of how we can measure this. We call this resilience. What is your chance if you come from the quarter of the most disadvantaged student population to still demonstrate excellence on the PISA test? And you can see, if you are in Vietnam, in Macau, in Hong Kong, in Singapore, Japan, Estonia, and so on, you'd have at least half of the children for whom the American dream of social mobility becomes true. They come from poor families, they do really well. If you are in Spain and Portugal, it's still quite high. And actually, it's one of the areas, people have noticed this in the, in the media debate here, it's one of the areas where Spain has seen real improvements. You know? When you talk about the overall performance, you know, I wouldn't make too much noise about it. I think it's more or less the same. But Spain has been successful in improving resilience, the chance of people from disadvantage to su su succeed. Now, it's quite a, quite a good improvement, particularly this way. But when you look at Peru, at the other end of the spectrum, this is where your chance to succeed. Now, almost zero. If you come from a poor family, getting out of that circle, getting sort of into a new world, very, very hard for you to do. This, this is an agenda where Peru, despite the progress it has achieved, you know, Peru and Colombia are the two Ibero-American countries that after Portugal has seen most progress. But still, the challenge of equity, 
is a formidable challenge in that part of the world. Let me come to the other end of the spectrum. I talked a lot about disadvantage, low performance. Let's talk about excellence in education. We call it level five and level, level six on the PISA test. And I encourage you, have a look at some of those tasks. What 15-year-olds have to do to reach the highest level is really hard. These tasks are very difficult. You have to really think creatively. You have to develop your own solution. You have to look at different solution strategies. Now, 300,000 students in the United States have that kind of high level of performance. Why? Not because the United States produces a lot of excellence. In fact, it's only about, you know, eight and a half percent. It's like here. This is sort of very poor, this is very good. The United States doesn't have a lot of high-performing students in relative terms. But the United States is a very big country. No? So if you add it all together, there are a lot of smart people. No? That's what you can see here. Not because the system is good, but because the system is big. This is more interesting. These are four tiny provinces in China. Beijing, Shanghai, Jiangsu, Guangdong. And you know, Guangdong is like Mexico in terms of its level of economic development. It's not a wealthy place. It's like, you know, Mexico in terms of economic development. These are four out of 30 provinces in China. But because the, the, the diagram is very dark blue, you know, these have actually very high levels of strong performance. They make up about, you know, big part of the pie in terms of the top performing students in the world. The next part is Japan, high performer, large country, then comes Germany. And that is about half of the world population in, in terms of tomorrow's, you know, science, scientists and engineers. And you can see, had we captured all of China, it would probably be more like this. No? But the rest is very small. No? And when you think, for example, here, Spain and Brazil make an almost equal contribution to the global talent pool. Why? Well, Spain has a moderate density of excellence in the school system, but it's small. And Brazil has a low density of excellence, but it's a large country. No? But that's basically how the pool of the smartest students on the PISA assessment looks across countries. Now, there's a lot more contribution. If you think about the population size of Ibero-American countries, you put them all together. They should be around, you know, like this, in this diagram. Very sort of strong, uh, strong capacity of the systems to raise contribution to the global talent pool when we think about excellence. And you can see that here. Basically, the strengths of the system, this is about, on average, in OECD countries, about you know, 8% reaching the top level. And in Uruguay, Chile, and Brazil, it's getting to very small percentages on those things. But this was about performance. What about the dreams that 15-year-olds have for their own future? One of the new things that we did in the latest PISA round, we asked children, what do you want to do in your life? And one of the questions we were very interested in is, how many do we want actually to become a scientist? We knew what they could do, but to what extent did they see science as something that is going to open up their future, their life? And here you see the results in different science uh, professions. When you see this chart, and you look at the countries, you get puzzled. Huh? I want to show you a group of countries here. Korea, Japan, Finland, China, Germany. Huh? If you remember, on PISA, these students do really well. No? They come up with high school, science schools. But they tell us, this is the last thing I want to do in my life. No? Something has gone wrong in those education systems. No? And the Koreans, even the Finns, Chinese, Germans. No? The system succeeded to teach them science, but the education system did not succeed to make it their own perspective, their own life opportunities. If you have a look at 
Ibero-American countries, you know, Costa Rica, Dominican Republic. Number one is in Dominican Republic. No? They did really badly on the PISA test. But they have the largest share of young people who say, I want to become a scientist they will probably not be able to realize their dreams because they do not have the knowledge and skills. But one thing they have, and that is an aspiration. You can see that is true almost all for Latin America. No. Uruguay a little bit less, but for most of the countries in the region, we see a very strong aspiration for young people to move in the science. So we ask ourselves, you know, what is the missing link? Countries, some countries are doing well, but people don't want to become scientists. Some countries do not do well, but they like science. Well, the answer is this. When we ask students, actually, to what extent they like what they do, they enjoy what they do. No? When students do not enjoy what they do, you can see the relationship between the science performance and the career aspiration exists but it's very moderate. No. For people who do not like what they do, it doesn't really influence their career. They may do well on the test, but they do not say with a large, much larger propensity they want to become a scientist. When people enjoy it more, and when they enjoy it very much, you can see actually the relationship becomes a lot stronger. And that's an important outcome. No. If education succeeds only to sort of get people filling up with knowledge and skills, but not to engage them, to genuinely interest them in what they do, is not enough to translate into career aspirations. At least at if the they achieve the same PISA result. And what you can see here is that, you know, if you are in Spain, you are five times more likely to repeat a grade if you come from a disadvantaged family even if you have the same science result of someone from a privileged family. So you can really see how great repetition, you know, student schools try to be academically selective. No? That's the goal. But they end up to be socially selective. No? Great repetition is just enhancing the effect of social background. It's just one phenomenon, but one that is really important. The second point that we learned from PISA is investing the resources where they can make most of a difference. Attracting the most talented teachers into the most challenging classrooms. Making wise choices between where resources matter most. No? When high-performing education systems have to make a difficult choice between, you know, do I invest in the better teacher or in a smaller class? They always invest in the better teacher. Have a look at some of the uh, data here. This shows you spending per student no? versus PISA performance. And you can say, in most of Latin America, money makes a huge difference. No? If you are, for example, here in Colombia, Colombia doesn't spend very much on education. No? If the Colombians would just invest a little bit more in education, they would probably get a lot better results. No? For most of Latin America, money is a huge barrier to improvement. But when you get to Costa Rica, you know, you get to a turning point. And when you get to Spain, you're beyond the turning point. No. When you spend about, you know, $50,000 per student between age 6 and 15, that's the moment when you have to ask yourself, really, you know, how do I invest my resources? How do I make sure that the money arrives where I can make most of a difference? No. And then beyond that point, you know, volume of spending isn't as important. What becomes important is how do we align resources with needs. And that's what the PISA data have shown. They actually show that spending money more equitably does not only give you more equitable results, but also better results. There's a very, very important relationship in that. And this is one of the most troubling charts that I want to show you. This is not about how much countries spend on education. This is how well they align the resources with the challenge. No? You want to be in the green area where you can say the students who live in disadvantage, who go to disadvantaged schools, they get more resources. No? And that's basically here the, uh, the, the, the circle. And 
they get the better teachers. And it's true, actually. This is very impressive. You look, if you look to Costa Rica, you could say that. Costa Rica has been quite successful, at least to be neutral to students. No? Students don't get penalized for coming from disadvantage. But when you look here to the case of Mexico no, or Peru, here you can really see if you come from a disadvantaged family, they're going to put you in a disadvantaged school and you'll get fewer resources and also the less qualified teacher. No? So this is where education systems reinforce social disparity. Of course, you know, in both Peru and Mexico, there are reasons for this. There's a big divide between cities and rural areas and so on. There are many explanations for why this is like this. But you can see how large the penalty is. No? When you saw at the beginning that, you know, poverty becomes destiny, that there were so few students in Peru, who were able to break the barrier, who were able to succeed despite disadvantage, this is part of the answer. This is not because of their families or their own social background. This is because the way we structure our school systems, the way we direct resources to where they are needed, is reinforcing those kinds of social disparities. So attracting resources where they can make most of a difference. You can see that also, you know, when you look at um, access to pre-primary education. No. How can we create a good foundation for children, particularly from disadvantage? Well, let's give them access to education before they get to school. And you can see some countries are doing that really well. But you can see again, you know, the example of Chile is here. And Portugal. No. I said many positive things about Portugal. But early education is something where they're not doing well. But what's also worrying is, there are two symbols on this chart. No? These are the children in wealthy backgrounds, and the blue dot are the children from poor families. No? If we have only a few places in early childhood education, well, we would want to give it to the disadvantaged families so that they can catch up. But you can see in most countries, it's exactly the opposite. The children from the wealthy families get the access, and the children from the poor families left behind. So early childhood education, the great equalizer, actually ends up to be the great reinforcer of social uh, disparities. True in most countries, true certainly in most Ibero-American countries. No. Not all, but most. I want to come to the toughest part. I put it very much to the left side of the chart, because building capacity, attracting great people into teaching, develop them, making sure that every child benefits from excellent teaching, the profession. The most important part, you know, the quality of learning can never exceed the quality of teachers, quality of teaching. But this is really difficult. What Pisa suggests is that it has less to do how we educate people before they get into schools. You know, the university degree, we don't see much of an effect on the outcomes. Where we do see big effects is how we organize the work for teachers, how we support them, how we continue to educate them. That's where we can see really big difference. And I want to show you a couple of charts that are important. The first is, on the vertical axis, I show you the student-staff ratio. No? If you are high up, you have only few teachers for your students. If you are low, you have plenty of teachers per student. On the horizontal axis, I show you the class size. And now many people tell me, well, you know, that should be the same. The class size should be the same as the student-staff ratio. But they're not. And you see some really interesting examples. Look at, you know, um, <coughs> Dominican Republic, Brazil, Colombia, Mexico. They have few teachers and they have large classes. No? Well, if you have only a few teachers, you have to make your classes, classes large. No? But here, where do we have? Peru is an interesting case. No? Peru actually has quite a good number of teachers, but still small classes. And I want to contrast this now with China. China has a similar student-staff ratio, but has very large classes. What do those two countries do differently? Well, you know, in Peru, 
what the teachers do is very clear. They teach in the classroom, one lesson after the other, like teachers in Spain. What the teachers in China do is they teach only you know, a few hours. They develop their profession. They have a lot more room. They have a large class to teach, but they have a lot more space to work with parents to do other things than teaching. So you can see two countries with the same student-staff ratio can use their teachers in very, very different ways. And there's a lot we can learn from this. I want to talk a little bit about accountability and evaluation. Very, very important topic. And um, <coughs> I want to start with a paradox in the instruction system. If you look at Spain and Portugal and every country in the Ibero-American uh, context, you give students one hour more mathematics teaching and they will do better on the PISA mathematics test. You give them one hour more science teaching and they will do better on the science test. You give them one hour more reading and they'll do better on the reading test. No? More instruction in every country leads to better outcomes. Sounds intuitive, no? When you do that across countries, you see this. It seems from the chart, the more our students learn, the worse they do on the PISA test. So try to think about it. Within a country, more learning, better outcomes. Across country, time doesn't seem to matter, or time seems to be negative. What's the answer? Well, learning outcomes are always the product of the quantity of teaching and the quality of teaching. You can improve outcomes by doing more of the same, increasing the quantity. But you can improve outcomes much faster by increasing the quality of learning. Why is this important? Because the only real constraint in education is the time of students. You can always add more money into the system, hire more teachers. Well, if that's the political commitment is there, you can do that. Or what you can't multiply is the student learning time. You want to make sure that students have a life. And actually, what we can see from this chart is that outcomes have less to do with the, with the quantity than we think, and a lot to do with the quality. So, we have tried to measure this. This is the time students learn spent in school, in blue, and the yellow part is the time students spend learning outside school, homework and other things. No. It varies a lot across countries. And now we can relate that to the learning outcomes, and we can do something that I call the kind of productivity index. No. How much learning is actually achieved per hour of learning at home or at school? And you can see Finland. It's a very interesting case. No? School hours are short, students do very little homework, but per hour learned, they do really, really well. No. Next comes you know, <coughs> Germany, Switzerland, Japan, Estonia, Sweden. Schooling, the volume is not so high, but the outcomes are quite good. This is interesting. China, no? they do very well on the PISA test, but students have to really study hard. This is more than 50 hours. No? Huge amount of time. So relatively speaking, relatively to the huge time investment, they only do so-so. Actually, you can say per hour, both Spain and Portugal do better than China. But much of the Latin American countries have a challenge. No? They have actually quite long hours. Yeah, Dominican Republic and so on, quite long hours of teaching, but actually the quality of teaching needs a lot of improvement. No? So increasing hours gets you somewhere, but focusing on the quality is more. And that's again, you know, why in high-performing countries, many of them have to make a choice between a better teacher and a smaller class. They typically focus on the quality of teaching. We also see, and that's basically when we look at the nature of teaching, PISA for the first time included a teacher questionnaire. 
So we understood and learned a lot about the nature of teaching. And what we saw is that, you know, whether teachers have well-structured lessons that are clear, informative, it was a very, very important predictor for student learning outcomes. So the way in which teachers structure, the, ex the capacity of teachers to adapt their lesson to the needs of students, also a very, very important predictor. I don't have the time tonight, but some really interesting data on that topic, looking at the nature of teaching and how it varies across countries. You know, effective teaching, good teaching, has a lot less to do with the size of a class than people often think. Good teaching is about engaging all students. And some of the countries seem to do, achieve very strong student-teacher relationship despite working in quite difficult contexts. Let's talk a little bit about uh, governance, and I'll keep that very short. Uh, just one highlight I really want to make is that, and you know that very well, that levels of school responsibility and autonomy in most of the Ibero-American countries are still very low. Basically, most of the systems still, by comparisons, have a very industrial work organization. They basically all work under similar contexts. Every teacher works the same hours, every teacher gets the same pay, you get more money when you become older. Sort of, it's a very, and schools have very limited degrees to design their own learning environments. When you go to the other end of the spectrum, you can see how basically schools and teachers are designer of their own learning environments. They have a lot of responsibility. There is a much more professional work organization than the kind of industrial work organization. So that varies a lot across countries. The way in which decision making is shared in the system. And you can look at this for the curriculum, you can look at this for staff, you can look at this for the management of careers. No? If you go to Sweden, for example, if you're a school principal in Sweden, well, you know, you have to decide how you pay your teachers, no? how you advance the careers. No? Very difficult decisions need to be made by schools, in schools. The curriculum. No? If you're in Finland, well, the national curriculum is about 40 pages. A little booklet like this. You have to decide what you want to teach to your students to uh, reach the national goals. No? Very, a lot of responsibility resting on the shoulders of teachers and school principals in many of the countries on the left side of that chart. Now, how does it relate to outcomes? That's sort of where things get very complicated and sort of it's not so easy to interpret these kinds of data. No? But one, what we can see is, for example, this is what the responsibility of school principals is. And you can basically say this is the impact on outcomes in science. And you can see when school principals are you know, owners of their resources, the curriculum, all of those kind of factors, outcomes tend to, do better, tend to be better. This does not mean that it's a causal relationship. It can also be that you know, we tend to give schools that are better performing more responsibility. It can go both ways, no? but there's a relationship. Teachers, the same thing. No? When teachers have a higher degree of responsibility for some of those things, no, adapting the curriculum and so on, uh, disciplinary policies, evaluation policies, you can see actually it seems to be inspiring better outcomes, whatever the cause or nature. When you look at this, the school councils is not so clear. No? And that's also difficult to compare across countries because the meaning of school councils can be very, very difficult. And then you look at regional governments, central governments, sort of the picture is sort of much more patchy than this. No? But the left part is important. Uh, level of discretion, level of responsibility at schools is very important. And this has nothing to do with public and private schools. In fact, I can say, you know, a Finnish public school has more discretion, more responsibility than a French private school. The public-private distinction is not what I'm talking about. It's really the level of responsibility and discretion that rests in individ individual schools. And you can see, really, it's an important predictor for outcomes. No? 
when combined with a strong system. That's the other part of the lesson, you know. Some people have just taken this chart a few years ago, you know, in Sweden. They said, oh, you told us every we just need to raise school autonomy and we become the world's best education system. Well, let's do that. And they did that. But they forgot one thing. They forgot actually to look at what the results are. And schools started to compete on lots of things that have nothing to do with the quality of education. I give you a driving license if you send your child to my school. Lots of things like this have happened. They never looked at the outcomes. And the outcomes actually in Sweden declined for almost one decade. Now we see a turning point. Sweden is building a strong education system. One, edu one lesson from this is actually the more responsibility rests in schools, the stronger the education system overall needs to be. These things do really go together. And this is just, I, I said basically what I wanted to say. You can look at the performance of public and private schools and you know, it looks as if most of the schools do better that are private, you know, particularly when you look at this without accounting for social background. But once you control for the social and economic background, in fact, in most countries, the public schools do better. So it really is not about public-private schools, a lot more about responsibility. There are also countries where, you know, private schools have a net benefit, but it's sort of, in most countries, it washes out. It's, again, you know, schools select more by their social background than they distinguish themselves in terms of ac academic quality. It's more about not how many charter schools do you have, but how you enable every school to assume the level of discretion and responsibility that you can see in some of those schools. Last point, and I'm not going to show you data on this because I think it's something I can talk very briefly, is about coherence in policy and practices. And I want to highlight two countries that have impressed me a lot in the Ibero-American context. One is Portugal. Portugal has gone through a lot of political changes over the last years, but they kept education moving forward. One government built on the reforms of the preceding governments. Now they changed on the margins, but overall there's a trajectory. You can really follow Portugal's reform from the year 2000 up to the year 2015. The other is Brazil. Same story. You know. Brazil has, you know, built its education system from the, from, the, uh, from the foundations. There was a big kind of shift in the year 2000, 2001, and since then they actually progressed quite smoothly. And that is so rare among the Ibero-American context. No? Most of the systems are very volatile. No? They change tomorrow to something else. But these two countries really stand out. The other part is, you know, to make actually sure that intended policies become implemented policies. No? You know, we can change a lot of laws and regulation. That's easy to do. But how do you actually change classroom practice? No? That is the trick. That's something that we can really learn, particularly well from the Asian education system, where you can really see when there's a policy change, it's carefully designed, carefully discussed. A curriculum reform in Japan takes 10 years, a lot of time. Why do they take so much time? Because they, w they want to bring every teacher on board, every parent on board, every student on board. It's a long process. But when it's done, it's done. And it works, actually. So this is, these are very, very important ingredients. So let me just summarize all of this, and then I'll be done. Then I look forward to your question. When you think about the past, it was enough to educate a few students really well. No? That's the history of schooling, the history of the industrialized mo model of schooling, sorting people, no? finding out who are the most talented people who lead our country, and giving everybody else some foundation skills. But it no longer works. Today, we need everyone. That's a big differentiator. Never before have people who are well-educated had the life chances they have today. And never before have the poorly educated paid as much of a price for low levels of education. And that is true despite the years of financial difficulties. And that has implications. In the past, you know, success was about routine cognitive skills. Today, the kind of things that are easy to teach, easy to test, are also easy to digitize, automate, outsource. The biggest criticism that I have around 
most modern school systems is that they downgrade humans to machines. No? We educate people to compete with computers. We teach them the kind of things that are going to be less successful. We have much less emphasis on the kind of ways of thinking, on the ways of working, on character qualities, no? leadership, curiosity, courage, resilience. No? Those are the ingredients that make people successful. That, you know, you find them, it's very, very hard to find them in the kind of mass education systems today. And that is huge implications for the quality of teachers. In the past, you know, you just selected people, give them a few more years of education. Today, success is about a professional work organization where we trust our teachers to be professionals. And we give them the work organizations, the careers, the way to advance that we owe a profession. And that, of course, has huge implications for the work organization. No? The one thing that is very clear, professional workers don't like to go into a factory. No? So the kind of accountability systems and work organizations that we have needs to mirror those transitions. Those are the big transitions that we are seeing in the most advanced education systems today. The world is still a long way from where we need to be. You saw that in my opening slide, the world around us is changing much, much faster than our school systems. The gap between what our societies expect and what our school systems deliver has not become narrow. It's become wider. But we do see some important changes here. And you have seen in uh, some areas, in the Ibero-American context, there is really, really good progress. No? Look at Colombia. Look at Peru. The first time I visited Peru, actually, it was with Jaime Mascaro and Emiliano. Actually, you know, it was a country that was torn by war, a country that was in a very, very difficult situation. They choose to focus on education. And you can see today, they can earn the fruits of their work. But the success is still far too rare. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Gracias, director. Buenas noches. It has been a long day, so I will be very short. Eh, directora de Casa América, desde mi nueva yo he sido una asistente durante muchos años aquí en diversas capacidades. Es un honor venir en esta nueva condición por primera vez aquí contigo. Señor secretario de Estado de Universidades, Emiliano Martínez, vicepresidente de la Fundación Santillana. Eh, Andreas Schleicher, I was told you were a myth in education, but our common friend Mariano Jabonero, and it proved to be true. I thank you very much for all the things I learned and I hope we will keep in touch. Don Luis Lezama, eh, directores de educación de la Comunidad de Madrid, de Castilla y León, enhorabuena por los buenos resultados. Y last but not least, Mariano Jabonero, que es un amigo desde hace años, una persona comprometida con la educación y que ha publicado recientemente un excelente artículo en el país. <coughs> eh, eh, dijo el, eh, Andreas Schleicher que global teaching is about involving all students. Global governance is all about involving all citizens and all countries. Y esto es lo que intentamos hacer modestamente desde la cooperación española. Pensamos siempre, y como alumno que fui de la educación española, que la educación tiene que ser un sistema para la reducción de desigualdades, para la potencia de las capacidades que cada ser humano lleva dentro de sí. Que la educación a lo largo de la vida nos ha de servir para aprovechar las oportunidades de ese mundo tan cambiante y tan lleno de amenazas, pero también de, de nuevas puertas que se abren para eh, aprovechar esas oportunidades. Hace mes y medio se clausuró la cumbre iberoamericana en Cartagena de Indias, en Colombia, la número 25, y entonces ahí el tema fue juventud, emprendimiento y educación, que yo creo son gran parte de los temas que aquí se han tratado. Tenemos ahora los Objetivos de Desarrollo Sostenible de 2030, tras los Objetivos del Milenio, que concluyeron en 2015, y ahí la educación aparece claramente como un derecho humano fundamental, como un bien público y como es básico para la erradicación de la pobreza. Nosotros, desde, la, desde que la cooperación española, incluso en sus fórmulas más históricas y tradicionales, inició, se ha centrado en la educación, entre otras cosas porque compartimos, eh, bueno, compartimos nombres y apellidos, compartimos valores comunes, compartimos educación, cultura, conocimientos. Entonces, siempre hemos procurado, y en, ya verán ustedes en el próximo plan director de la cooperación española, que se tiene que elaborar de 2017 a 2020, pero también en los anteriores, 
Nos vamos a centrar mucho en el apoyo a la participación de la comunidad escolar, una financiación previsible, una financiación que se pueda contemplar en el largo plazo, con eh, mucha atención a las poblaciones periféricas, las macrourbes, también de Europa, pero sobre todo de América Latina, con una población que se ha desplazado del campo a la ciudad, plantean una problemática particularmente aguda y particularmente de desigualdad social, unida a otros factores de eh, infrasaneamientos, infraviviendas, violencia doméstica, muchas cosas. También apoyar la formación técnica profesional, que está resultando ser en Europa algo muy importante, y la, intentar apoyar con mayor eficacia aún a los alumnos con eh, discapacidad. Um, I, I come right from Estonia, it were my former duties there, and I know, you know how impressive the results from Estonia are in a society which have a very moderate level of income, and they are in the top levels of the PISA system and the European Union system. Entonces, quizás inspirado por esa reciente experiencia y con lo aprendido aquí, vamos a intentar progresar en, y reforzar ese ámbito de nuestra cooperación. Hoy está aquí de visita y por eso he eh, llegado tarde el presidente Juan Manuel Santos, que viene de recoger el premio de la paz en Oslo, que ha firmado el Fondo Fiduciario para Colombia, que fue iniciativa española ayer en Bruselas y que hoy ha sido eh, investido doctor honoris causa. Si ustedes miran, y es una pieza de oratoria, absolutamente recomendable su discurso de aceptación del Nobel, verán ahí la importancia de la educación, cómo subyace al fin de la violencia, el reconocimiento a las víctimas y la educación. Este es un premio Nobel nuestro, por cuanto es un premio Nobel iberoamericano. Y ahí hay tres cosas que dice que en una ocasión le preguntaron, ¿y cómo está usted avanzando en la consecución de la paz? Dice, con el trabajo con esperanza y con el reconocimiento de los demás. Uno pensaría que el sistema educativo es también eso. A lo largo de su intervención menciona a aquella niña que fue amenazada de muerte, Malala, y Malala en unas recientes declaraciones dijo que lo que pedía es que hubiera, en vez de más dinero para armas, más dinero para libros, lápices, profesores y escuelas. Uno añadiría también tabletas y para la educación digital. Y lo que quizá la frase más significativa del discurso es que cesó la horrible noche. Cesó la horrible noche de la violencia, pero seguramente también pueden cesar la horrible noche de la ignorancia y la desigualdad. Muchas gracias y quedamos a su servicio.